to um, join. Um, th thank you for joining us today. Um, we're, we're going to go through a presentation on um, uh, basically a kind of a po post graph discussion on remote movie production and graphics collaboration. Um, and I'm joined today. My, my name is sorry. My name is Scott Johnson. I'm head of North America for Simple Cloud, and I'm joined by um, Harry Scopus and Jason Starn of um, Synesis. And Jason and Harry, if you could give a introduce yourselves, please. A little background. Go ahead, Harry. Oh, thanks. Thanks, J Dog. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Harry Scopus. Uh, I work along with Jason and uh, partnered with Scott. I, I'm with uh, Cinesis Oceana or Cinesis IO, our rebranded um, name. I'm a solutions architect and heavily involved with um, providing workflow solutions, media workflow solutions for a variety of clients in the M&E space, uh, including broadcasters, uh, sporting companies, um, retailers, media companies, visual effects companies, film, com film companies, really anybody that has to do anything with media. Uh, I, and I've had, uh, prior to uh, Synesis, I've had a long history in uh, the uh, post-production, visual effects production, and uh, film um, uh, industries. Uh, so happy to be here and uh, love working with Simple. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Harry. Very, very good. And I'm Jason Starn, guys. I know it says Jason Dog there, but that's some cruel joke that Scott's played on me. <laughs> um, I work with Harry. I'm a VP of Media Solutions at Cinesis, um, Cinesis IO now, Cinesis.io. And uh, I've been working with Simple Cloud for several years and um, saw, these, saw these guys about, I don't know, three years ago. And, uh, I got involved and started seeing the writing on a wall. I think they were onto something definitely way before COVID in this crazy world that we are in right now, um, where they were building or gave us a, a platform to build up studios virtually living in a IBM cloud data center. So uh, I've been in this industry, started as a 3D artist back in the mid nineties. So I've, I've been in this for quite a while. And I think when this started, they, they saw first of all, first off, to, a way to build up an animation studio. And then that's really kind of grown from there over the last years. And today I want to show you guys where where I used it, where we use it on a film, which was the first film uh, called Redstone that was greenlit after Hollywood reopened up. We shot here in Texas. We were definitely the first film in Texas to start shooting after Hollywood opened up. But for post of Redstone, actually during production as well, we used the Simple Cloud to to build a workflow and a pipeline that was super efficient where we shot a film starting on June 8th, finished shooting July 1st, and then finished editorial August 15th. And we are now in color and sound mix. So I wanna talk about that today alongside these guys and alongside nice. other things that Harry's been doing as well, so. Jason, was your, uh, just a quick one, was your film, like you said, was it was it the first post COVID, um, film that that really took place yes so first covid post covid well we're still in covid first yeah, yeah. Post reopening of hollywood uh, right as a sag film so yep. and maybe there was some non-union stuff going on but as far as sag after approving uh green lighting our film we were the first so. right Just and i was a, a producer and post supervisor on that film so that's my role with it nice awesome um, and so thanks, Jason. In terms of agenda today, I'm just going to give a very brief overview on Simple Cloud. Uh, and then we'll get into the discussion, and then we'll finish the webinar today with a brief demo. Jason will give us a brief demo of the platform, focusing on on the workflow he talked about. Um, I'm going to moderate the chat, the questions. So if you have them, I think um, we can we can just sort of answer them in real time as they pop up, um, or or when we take a break between the sections. With that, I'm going to share my screen to show very very just a few slides on Simple. Let me know. Jason, can you see that? Yep, we got you. Yep, you're there. All right. So um, um, Simple Cloud is a company started in 2008 as Sumus Render in, in Madrid, Spain. It was one of the first uh, uh, cloud-based render farms in Europe focused on media and entertainment. Uh, the, the, the fields we focus on now, and, and sorry, in, in, uh, about three or four years ago, we, we pivoted to create Simple Cloud, you know, which is a cloud-based platform for content creators. And, and we're going to give you a pre pretty detailed explanation of what's involved with the platform. In terms of industries, we focus on, on media and entertainment, including animation, visual effects, design, 
We also focus on education, you know, which is a huge focus for us, uh, video games, architecture, engineering, and manufacturing. And uh, just in a few words, Simple, Simple Cloud is a great platform. If you need to get a team of um, small, medium, large team of people working quickly, um, all, all you need is a, a thin client, sorry, um, and internet access. And, and you can get people working very quickly, um, accessing higher, higher compute power in the cloud um, to use the creative software um, that they need. In terms of backroom, where we use the IBM Cloud infrastructure globally, we use uh, VMware to, to generate the virtual desktops in the cloud. And within the IBM data centers, we have NVIDIA GPU, um, NVIDIA, NVIDIA GPU C100 graphics cards. And of course, some um, simple layer on top that provides everything you need to create studios and get people working. Um, I, IBM, um, we're, we're in data centers all around the world. We have coverage in the Americas, Europe, and Asia. IBM has um, 60 data centers worldwide, um, and as needed, we can scale up um, to be in any of these data centers globally. Uh, with, within the platform itself, all you need is a, a decent internet connection, three to five megs per screen, and, and we support up to four monitors in 4K. In terms of key benefits, I'll just focus on a few. Um, one of the main ones is scalability. Um, with, with Google Cloud, you can scale up and scale down very quickly. Um, is your project's demand. So if you, if you have a project that comes up quickly and you need to get a team of people working, um, Simple allows you to do that without having to make a, a big capital investment or an infrastructure. Um, it's flexible, you know, it allows you to work from wherever you want, whenever. Um, it's a secure environment, highly secure environment. Um, and and uh, in terms of business model, it, it allows companies to shift like a, from a CapEx business model to OpEx, you know, which is great. Um, it's customizable, so, so instead of having to adapt your company um, to work with a platform, uh, the platform is highly customizable and can be adapted to your way of working. And lastly, um, as a company, it can allow you to lower your physical footprint, um, you know, and basically allow people to work from home in a flexible manner. Last couple of slides, and we'll jump into the discussion. Uh, there, there's a few different ways we can work with our partners and, and customers. One is it could be a full cloud option, so so you could have 100%. You you can you can transfer 100% of your operation to the cloud, even simple. You know, take advantage of its tools. Um, and the second is hybrid, so it doesn't have to be an all or none proposition. You can you can take advantage. You, know, you can use part of simple, and we can link to your infrastructure as needed. Um, so with that I'm going to stop sharing this, and I think, I think we'll just jump into the, some of the questions we have. The panel. Now, Jason, Harry, anything you want to add before we jump in? I think that was a nice uh, brief overview. Of okay. It. Yeah, try to keep it short. Uh, jump into the morning part here. Um, so, so I think that the first question I have for you guys is, um, um, I guess if you could one at a time and take turns on, what what have the last six months been like, you know, for both of you in terms of um, you know business and, and working with your partners? You want to start here? Yeah. Um, well, it's it's. Definitely been interesting times. Um, not going to lie about that. Um, and I think initially, you know, even prior to this, uh, I think a lot of people in the M and E space were interested in working remotely um, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, being able to access talent from various um, locations throughout the country and the globe. Um, also, people that you know have various commutes and also for collaborative reasons you know if if you need to go uh, to on set or a remote location and you need to collaborate with your team back at the office um, you know a lot of these remote workflows were were starting to come to light and then when covid hit and everyone had to basically leave their their normal routine and go to work out of their homes or other remote locations it really kind of propelled everything so i guess in the beginning and um and and i think probably a lot of you guys can relate to it in the beginning it was uh, almost like a state of emergency it was firefighting people were trying to figure out you know what can i do how can i get up and working and you know, for a lot of simple desktop applications uh, or back office type work that, you know, is, is focused on spreadsheets, emails, uh, maybe using some type of a, a Salesforce type tool, uh, you know, a lot of the remote applications that are out there work just fine. But in our space where, you know, we're working with video and audio 
and you know the quality of the imagery um, is really important. You know, not just from a frame rate, but from a resolution and a color accuracy thing. It started to bring a lot of other challenges to it. So. Um, in the beginning, it was a lot of firefighting, like, hey, you know, how can we get up and running right away? Um, and what do we do so we can keep our, our, our business going because we don't know where all this stuff is going at? And then after that kind of got over that hump, uh, I've, my, my um, um, experience was that people were kind of circling back and trying to figure out, okay, we don't know how long this is going to go on, but it's going on longer than we thought, so how do we refine this process? Um, and so we went into the refinement stage and, and now I feel we're kind of getting into the next stage where we think this is going to be long-term, um, but also not long-term just because of COVID, but a, a lot of people are working effectively from their remote, remote locations and are trying to establish a more professional environment. Um, you know, so when they're working from the remote location, they feel as, as close to being in the office as possible, um, and also being able to collaborate with the media because obviously um, most of the stuff that we do is uh, is sharing of media, which you know simple, you know really really ties into that, um, and trying to figure all that out. So it's kind of been th for me, it's been like a three step process from from the beginning where it was firefighting, then it was like you know how do we make this better by refining it. And now it's like, how do we really make it better by becoming uh, more professional? And how can we get into the next level of collaboration, both on the media, but also. So that's my uh, experience over the past six months. Jason, what's. Yeah, no, I, I think you hit it. Uh, hit the oh, nail on the head. Audio. Oh, man. There you go. Are you not hearing me now? I can Got hear you. Yeah. It's, I don't think it's my, I think it's my internet. Yep, there you go. So, yep. Okay. Um, no, I think you, you definitely yeah. hit the nail on the head because what you said in the beginning was true. Like everybody was trying to figure out how do we continue to work, right? How do we keep business going? And more importantly, how do we get business continuity running? How do we keep that going? Um, and then after the first two or three months of really struggling, like there was a lot of solutions that started coming out and people started to see other solutions that could work like we were able to show a lot of the simple to people and that that made it uh, exciting for them because they were able to jump on and then figure out new and better workflows or i guess yeah well better workflows than what they were trying to do because everybody just scrambled and started getting online to figure out how to work remotely and so we've gone to these like these phases now where the second phase of this is like hey let's refine what we've tried to do remotely and then like what harry said is now people and i worry about real estate at this point like what's going to happen going forward because some people are just able to do their jobs better from where they are and mm -hmm. and depending on where they live and might even have a better quality of life because they're not spending two hours just traveling every day you know so right so now we're looking at like how do we make this part of our core business and you know with what we do with what the simple cloud guys do it, it's really a great solution because they don't force you to go all full cloud. We have this full, I think Scott touched on it, this hybrid model where, you know, these some of these companies have these big investments internally, right? And they're just not gonna walk away from that. So these guys at Simple Cloud saw that early on and they're like, okay, well, let's let's integrate and not just try to be a replacement. And I think some of these places think they're just replacements and they're missing so much of overall day-to-day -day workflows that need to be part of you know, media and entertainment that have to happen. So, right. And, and Jason, um, maybe also for you, the last six months, you know, being on the production side of things, right? I mean, how was that was severely impacted, right? Um, and, yeah. you know, when you do have these solutions, you know, they, they kind of help things along a little bit. But how was that for you for the past six months? Um, well, it feels like, and I bet everybody would agree to this. It feels like working remotely, and I've talked with some customers about this. It feels like we're working longer hours now than what yeah. we were doing before. Like you sit down at 8 a.m. and you're still in your chair at 8 p.m. and you haven't had dinner and your wife's yelling at you. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> um, yep. 
I can but, relate to that. Yeah. So on the production side, like that stuff really slowed down, right? Like nobody was out shooting just because people were afraid. And then like there just wasn't a lot of content being made. And I think that's now starting to starting to change just now. There's there's more content going, but there's still things that uh we just don't know. I mean, you, you look at things like Tenet, right? That release and, and opened in theaters. I don't know where what's going on in theaters in the rest of the world, but in Texas, like theaters have opened to with like minimal uh, crowds, right? Like limited people can be inside of the screen. Um, and so like these movies that are now releasing or trying to release or they're holding on to them because they don't want to release them yet because they, they're not generating a revenue. They, they, right. There, things are just weird. So, like, yeah. Tenet, $200 million budgets made $30 million. I mean, that's a movie you need to see on a big screen. And uh, Right. So, I, I don't know, I'm talking in circles here, but going back, I think for me, the last six months, is it was pretty dead until, um, from March was the last time I traveled. Um, everything just shut down in, like, end of March, it was, or beginning of March, it just shut down, like, completely. And then April was kind of, like, nothing going on. Um, May, nothing going on, and then all of a sudden June, like okay, Hollywood's gonna say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna let you guys start doing stuff, and I think there were some little skeleton crews out there doing things. You started seeing uh, some new kind of spots, but really different uh, the way things were shot, like the way commercials were being made and stuff. Uh, the writing was a lot different. People were rewriting a lot of things. And then also people were going to their archives and we were just revising a lot of spots and, and commercial work was just being revised. But then like when June happened, Hollywood kind of lifted a little bit. I, I started seeing like productions really like kick up. Um, but then they kind of slowed back down again. Um, and I think now we're back in this other phase of them kicking kicking back up. But movies are pushing, starting, stopping, starting, stopping. I think Scott and I are experiencing that with a big customer, you as well, Harry, um, where a film's pushed four times at this point, like release dates. And yeah. so it's a lot more expensive to, to work right now, I think. Um, testing is expensive when you have to test crews and stuff. Like there's a lot of regulations going on that we're trying to keep everybody safe. And, not knowing, not having like a definitive date on things is, is makes things a little bit more difficult. So, but it, but it's had a the whole production cycle. Scott has had a trickle mm -hmm. effect on everybody. Um, yeah, it's not just uh, on the long form work; it's also on the commercial work. Um, you know, there's a lot of people are doing animation and all that stuff and, and mm -hmm. trying to become creative on, on that side. So, you know, the simple stuff really kind of helps in both areas as productions coming up where people can push stuff into the cloud and start, you know, working. And also from a, um, a VFX and uh, design standpoint where, an animation standpoint where, you know, they can, if they need to scale up and spin stuff up to get a lot of artists working uh, remotely, they can easily spin up simple stuff and, and start doing their animation or their graphic design yeah. or whatever it is, their VFX work. So it's had a trickle effect over the past six months. Yeah, and I was leading into that, like without, like knowing you can use the cloud and using simple as in the post process, once the, the data is captured somewhere on camera, then this is the easy part now, I think, is bringing it all together, bringing a team together, like having a platform like simple allows you to do that and i mean I, I've, I've proved it like we went through a production no one got sick and then we were done editing a production in 45 days right so it's pretty unheard of in the covid world so if people start seeing that that this is possible then i imagine they'll be less afraid to like let's just get through production and post will be a lot easier to figure out because we yeah. don't have to go sit next to each other anymore to do this yeah. Cool. No, thanks for that. Um, let me jump on to the, the, the second uh, topic. Can, can you both comment on collaboration and, and I guess how you've seen companies challenged during this process? Yeah, I mean, look, in nature, the a, a lot of what gets done 
on the production post production side of things it it already is a collaborative process you know that's it's um artists and um technologists and visionaries all kind of working together and they typically it's 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 a it's an artistic field and people like to collaborate and work with each other and bounce ideas off of each other so you know i think it has been hard from a purely human standpoint you know where people um especially in this industry really like to collaborate and feed off of each other and it's it's as simple as like viewing something or doing something and reading somebody's body movements right it's not even just does that look good or not look good it's like you know when you're doing something and creating something you want to see are people excited are they moved by it whatever it is so you know collaborations a big part of it from a, a human standpoint and also from a work standpoint you know if, if jason's out shooting all this stuff and you know he wants people to view it and say hey what do you think of it you know you've got editors you've got graphics going on you've got maybe animators going on you've got all these different disciplines working together and you know getting everyone on the same page and working that's that's part of the process um you know so that's that's a pretty easy um thing you know as far as you know the the platform that that simple provides is being able to kind of push that media up into a shared space where you can have different people kind of looking at it and uh working on it and collaborating with it and also you know viewing it because you know you can install different types of viewers on there um that can uh stream it to different to um uh different areas so people can view it but collaborations uh, a really really big part of uh the day-to-day -day business uh that we're in yeah that's very good um yeah, I mean, Harry steals the show there with what he says is completely true. And I'll throw this in there. When when you are collaborating, and we're look, we're creatures of habit, right? Like, nobody likes change. I think a lot of change was forced on us. Um, and I, I do think this is one of the power. This this is something to look at if you're looking at, like, a remote or trying to build a, a workflow. you got to look at what the end goal is that you achieve. And who you're working with and how they like to work, right? Some people, and, and still, uh, some positions they 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 still need certain things. Like maybe you need five line audio. You're in an audio room. You, you might not be able to do that remotely the way you like doing it. So, um, to reiterate what Harry was saying, like we had a music composer out of LA working with us, and the aspect that he used Simple Cloud was much different than how we used it. He was uh, basically, and I'm going to show you guys a slide on that when we get there, but he was just pulling down audio files via, I'm sorry, pushing audio files to us via FTP, but he was pulling down scenes as we were cutting so that he could create the score. And this was, I mean, a completely different way that to use simple than the way we were using it, but it was it worked for him, and he still got to maintain his workflow uh, in the audio side, and was really happy about that. So, I think being flexible or having a system that allows you to be flexible, where you're not changing somebody's daily habits that they've done for forty years. Um, yeah. So he was really happy about that, and and for us as editors or creators you're just getting in a piece of software application anyway so you're not really changing too much of your workflow but from an audio standpoint it, it, i could see that being a bit different so yeah that was a good point jason you know the the change and you know people when we are creatures of habit you know you get to be working in a certain way a certain methodology and and that all got a lot of that got thrown out the window uh yeah. when all this started so that was a, a good point that you brought up. Yeah, well, you know, we we still, and still to this day, like and you've dealt with it too. I mean, a lot of creatives are Mac people, right? Yeah. And then having to jump on doing their work on, on a Windows machine was like, oh, I can't do that. But then mm -hmm. some, once they start, they're, they're probably okay with it because they're just in an application anyways. So they don't know what they're on. Uh, right. Well, you know, there is that, that, uh, yeah. That hump you got to get over sometimes. Um, yeah, and a lot of it's mental. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it's mental. <laughs> but you know, hey, our job is to find ways to keep people working at, and being creative and working as efficiently as possible. So sometimes, you know, you find other ways, like what we did with our music composer. Right? He was right. just pulling audio files and then putting them in and then re-uploading to us. So.
Yep, makes sense. Cool. Um, are, are there examples you can both share in terms of how, how um, I mean, you may have touched on this a little bit, but um, do you have other examples about how, how workflows have helped some of your partners? Harry, do you yeah. want to talk about that, uh, that yeah. athletic company? <laughs> Yeah, we've been, um, you know, we've been working with a, a lot of various companies, but you know, one that comes to mind was a, a, a leading fitness uh, company who's looking to have a larger media presence. And, you know, they've got a lot, a lot, a lot of footage um, and um, that, that lives on-prem and they necessarily didn't want to push it to the cloud. Uh, mm -hmm. They wanted to be able to have all of that because it was, you know, many terabytes close to probably approaching a petabyte uh, of stuff that they wanted to have uh, accessible. So, you know, they turned to the simple solution to be able to have all of their creatives work remotely um, by spinning up the workstations uh, and being able to access their on-prem media so they could continue their workflow. And also, you know, some people were, were using it was kind of like that hybrid solution that that was the hybrid slide where, you know, some of the the stuff uh, was from a workstation standpoint was spun up in the cloud. They were utilizing on-prem workstations, but most of their media, uh, or, or you know, all of their media lived on-prem, but they wanted to have access to it. So they were kind of using the storage on the simple side as almost like a working cache, you know, so they would push the stuff up that they were working with people um, go in and do whatever they are. If they're doing the Adobe, if they're editing or if they're doing graphics using any the, the Adobe products, or if they were compositing on nuke, whatever it was, they would spin up the appropriate workstation with the right applications in the, in the, in the simple cloud, um, get that going. They'd push the media up on their work on it. And when they were finished, they'd push it back to the office. Uh, back into its um, storage location or keep those two locations in sync. And then they would have it for their on-prem stuff if they needed to, for mm -hmm. people that were on-prem uh, to work with that media, or if they needed to do other things to package it so they could uh, send it to their delivery service and so on and so forth. So for them, it was, um, it was the way that they wanted to work. They wanted to have this hybrid cloud solution and, and simple really kind of, um, stepped into that perfectly. And then I think, Jason, I think you, you used it like you touched before on, on uh, Redstone and, and uh, one of your post uh, companies that, that you've uh, been working for. Yeah, Lucky Post, a uh, big editorial uh, commercial post company in Dallas had a lot of success um, using the platform. And so they're Gosh, they're running. I think there were eight eight Adobe editors, um, two graphic designers, and they were able to. Man, within I think we got them running over a weekend, like really early on, trying to figure some stuff out. And they just, they were one of the early adopters of going to the full cloud. And they, it was a lot of workflow, like what Harry just discussed. And I'm seeing this a lot because you don't want to. Not that you can't, you could, but I think it's probably not the smart move. Is push your entire on prem storage up to the cloud because that can get really expensive if you're hosting a petabyte of media you know and you're paying monthly for that that's going to run you probably fifty thousand dollars a month or something just something ridiculous so they would just push what was necessary right they'd push it up to the to the bucket in the cloud and simple cloud the volume and then they would just edit from there and then uh with lucky we, we did something special uh, and this is this shows the flexibility of Simple Cloud, where we added Evercast into the mix, and so they were actually streaming their edit, editing sessions out to the producers and creative directors for approvals, and that was all happening out of the data center. So that was that was pretty interesting. Um, and there's a case study on that we can share with everybody that, that wants to see it. So, and there, um, there there was a question about sharing the deck. If if you um, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, yeah. Email me and share it after um, for people that want to see it. I, I saw that. Um, I know who that is. We'll, we'll share that with Mark. I mean, the the great thing about um, the solution, the, you know, the the simple um, software stack, um, it, it is is very easy to configure and very flexible. So, you know, one day you may you may just want to do you may just need edit. One day you may need a lot of compositing, and like you were saying, Jason, you know, to to get it up and running. 
uh, is fairly simple. I mean, the more complicated aspects of it are, you know, if you do host a lot of media on your on your site, uh, keeping it all in sync, and how do you want to kind of keep all the the, the your your data um, kind of in sync and flowing and uh, organized. Um, but you know, the solution is is very easy. You could, you know, just sign up, spin up a workstation point it to your license and you're up and running and it, it could be in a matter of an hour. So it, it is very, very flexible. And once the studio is set up, right, you can add things, you can change things, you can get more powerful yeah. systems, less powerful systems. And that's all very easily configurable, which, you know, helped my client being, being able to figure out, all right, what do we need? What don't we need? What do we need today? Can we scale this up? Can we scale this down? So it really helps with, um, you know, if, if there's deadlines to reach and you need to bring in additional people, you know, it's not going to be the slag where, well, now it's going to take two weeks to get this spun up and add this, all this other infrastructure. It's like, well, I just need more instances and, you know, do it and you're up mm -hmm. and running. And it really helps with the delivery of projects. Yeah. All right. Um, no, th thanks for sharing all that. Um, I think uh, now we could probably transition to the demo. Or Jason, did you want to share? I think you may have had a slide you want to share, or do you want to do you want to roll um, into the demo? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll do that. I'll share, talk about what how we a, a real workflow that we used uh, that we put in place for for this movie Redstone, and then I'll just run people through the uh, the platform quickly, mm -hmm. and we can go to Q and A. I'm sure people have some questions and then hopefully get you guys out of here in the next 10 minutes. So, so you can get on your next zoom call. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't wait for my next call. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, I'm going to go to, I'm going to take over the screen uh, sharing. If that's okay, Scott. Yeah. I'm going to try, like, try to. I don't know if I need to hit anything here. No, I think you should be seeing some of the login at this point, right? Yeah. I see that. All right. And here's something. We'll see where we are at this point. I'm running a speed test. Oh, not bad today. Not pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad. I'm excited. It's with my kids at school. When she's home, this is way down because she's just streaming like Netflix on six television. Okay, that's not bad. So, because the, the question comes up a lot when. Um, when you're talking about what kind of internet speed do I need, what kind of latency, like this is the huge thing, right? Your latency. And if you can stay under 80 milliseconds, you have a really good experience um, when you're working remotely. So, and and really for us, it's just a download. We just need, we care more about the pixels. Uh, and the upload stuff is just inputs, which is just USB stuff. So it's not, not that much is required for that. But if you're running between 20 and 30 megabits, 20 and 40, you, you have a, pretty good um, experience. I mean, it's a really good experience. You, you tend to forget you're not working local. So I wanted to show that I always run a speed test. I'm actually on wireless. So I'm breaking the cardinal rule, which you should be wired if you're working on a remote station. But today I'm not. Um, so let me jump over to this uh, preview here. And then I'll, I'll talk about our workflow for this movie. By the way, this movie, we, we hope to um, release in the next, uh, I don't know, 45 days, we should be done with audio by the end of the month. Um, but if you missed the front of the call, this was a movie that was really first uh, SAG film to be greenlit after Hollywood reopened. And it was shot here in Texas, uh, in Corsicana, Texas. And the story about that is we this movie was going to be shot in and around Fort Worth, Texas. But then numbers, you know, COVID and everybody being concerned about that we decided to move to Corsicana because Corsicana is it's about the same distance outside of Dallas Fort Worth it's about 45 minutes outside of downtown Dallas a small town in Navarro County and Navarro County at the time 36 cases in the whole county and there were only eight cases in the city of Corsicana and out of those eight cases those those people were all outside of city limits they all lived in the county so we felt mm -hmm. pretty good about shooting there and um, it, it definitely helped with uh, getting the green light from SAG to saying, hey, we're moving this from Fort Worth to, from a big city to a smaller, smaller place. So and it, it had everything there uh, that we needed to, to shoot this film. Uh, the film was shot with two red weapons. This is all just kind of a guideline. 
Mm -hmm. um, Dragon Sense 6K with Cook anamorphic lenses. Um, so it was shot 2, 4 to 1. One of the uh, things that was cool, what we were able to do is on our A camera, which is uh, DSMC2, which is a firmware that runs on RED, the newest firmware, allows you to build QuickTime proxies inside the camera. So that camera always generated uh, proxies. And then the second cam, which is our B cam, was DSMC1, so it, it didn't. Those proxies needed to be transcode. But if you, you follow this line here, after camera raw, and we would get uh, mags every day at lunch and in the evening, and we would start, we had a video village there on set or nurse set where this person, AH, Amanda Hughes, uh, who's our lead editor on the film, was also the set editor. She would transcode the second cam, if needed, the B cam, to, to matching uh, quick times from the A cam, and then also build the dailies. So she would do the audio syncs. And that data was captured on a Codex Media Vault. So you need, you definitely, I try to tell people if you're, you're shooting these things, don't, uh, don't cheap out and just get like a, you know, a lacy drive. So not to say that lacy is bad, but just like a single hard drive. You want something that's got some RAID and something you can rely on to keep your media, right? So what we would do is we'd back the media up here to the Media Vault right away. And then that would actually go to a second hard drive. And then it would also go to an LTO8. Um, and the media would go to LTO8 at the end of the week, so we would we were back backing up weekly to LTOs. But at the same time, when Amanda would, after she would get finished with the the sync, um, which she was uh, pushing, she would she would sync this. We'd push it up to simple, and then we were using iconic over here. So we were talking about um, like animators or other people needing to get started on a project or looking at it. Well, one thing he didn't say was the EPs. They want to see stuff. So these executive producers that are paying the money for this show, they wanted to see what was going on. So we really used Iconic in that way. And so we were able to push that into Iconic, which is a web-based uh, platform that allows you to look at look at sequences, make notes, and then share those, right? And so that's, that's what we use for that. And so Simple Cloud plugs into that easily. That's a whole web-based thing, but also runs a, um, you can use Iconic through Adobe Premiere with a plugin. So that's how that worked. Um, then this in the center, this is the whole Simple Cloud platform. So if you, you look up here in Fort Worth, we had two editors working, Amanda Hughes and Derek Presley. So he's also the writer director and had a lot of eyes on editing. And they were all using Simple Cloud. And I'm going to show you guys the whole Redstone studio for this here. And then I talked earlier about Stephen Inman, who was a music composer. He actually came out on set because he likes to see and talk with the director and get a feel for the movie while they're shooting, right? Really, really get to know the film. So, But Stephen's a Pro Tools guy, has his rig set up. We can talk about that, loves working that way. But what we did was set up an FTP, a direct... Um, FTP link so he could just pull down files whenever scenes were done editing From Amanda and Derek He would grab those scenes so they would do an export and then he would pull that down locally and he would start the score on the scene And then he would push that score back through FTP back over to do y'all see my mouse by the way when I'm searching Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, so I he would push that back. Hopefully that's not too crazy But he would push that back to the simple cloud and what we have here was like one big shared pool of storage. It wasn't even that big. I, I looked at today, we had one terabyte for the whole film because we're editing in the cloud on ProRes. Okay. So it was about, I think there's 700 gigs or so of media that went up to the cloud. So it wasn't, it wasn't a whole lot. It was, uh, that's something you could do very, very quickly. And then the, the full edit pipeline was Adobe Premiere, but then you got me down here and I'm in, I'm in Frisco. And what I would do is pull down, because I'm dealing with online and color, and obviously you're not going to online with uh, the HD ProRes QuickTime, so we're going to go back to the red raw for color and for the online. And so I would pull down the Premiere file locally, relink it to the RAWs that I have sitting on Codex, mm -hmm. and then set my uh, export. Uh, in this case, I exported a Final Cut XML because it, our online happened in, in Flame and the colors happening in Luster. So that the, the Final Cut XML out of Adobe Premiere, which seems weird, works flawlessly going into Flame. So, so this was pretty much the workflow. It was very simple. And when I said some people use simple in a different way, that's where I, we have Stephen here, our composer, 
who was just attached to the storage and he was just getting stuff in and out of the storage whenever it was made available to him. So, Hey Jason, I have a question. So, mm -hmm. um, your set editor and the other editors, um, and Steven, were they using, uh, workstations that were spun up in simple or were they just pulling media from it? These guys, the, the editors and set editors were using workstations and stuff. I should put like a desktop here or something, but right. yeah, these were all simple workstations. Uh, the editors, the, Steven was not, he was just pulling media from, right. from the cloud storage. Yep. Right. So, and then myself, of course, I, I jumped on simple workstations, but at the end of the day for, to finish online in color, it wasn't through the cloud. It was pulling down the project file, which was tiny, right? It's, it's just a bunch of text, um, you know, a premier project. And then, Relinking re forming it here and then relinking to the high res, right? And oh, then cool. building the XML from that to go into Flame for the online, and then Flame pass that to Luster for color, and then it'll go back to Flame. So, right, nice. So that that made it's a really really easy workflow. So, um, so I'll I'll go from there and just jump out of that and I'm gonna go back to my browser here and go to another page, just to talk about the the platform itself, right? So the way it works is you can actually, any HTML5 supported browser, could be Chrome, could be Safari, uh, as long as it supports HTML5, you can use that browser to actually work on a workstation if you wanted to. You could spin up a workstation, you could build one. So I'm gonna log in here uh, from the web browser. And I'm using this user, this is my power user. I, I checked this out earlier, I don't think there's any studios in here that are, it's gonna, set off any alarms about who's using it. But um, quickly in the dashboard, what you see, you got buttons up here. So these are basically just different menus, right? So these are studios and you can see different studios in here. Um, in the dashboard, you'll see all the studios and these are studios that I belong to as this super user uh, login that I'm using. And these are workstations down here. And any workstation that shows up for this user, I could just click this plug and it'll spin up that workstation. These are active sessions right now. These are people that are actively using a workstation within one of these studios, um, which I can tell, right? EA, BA. So, and these are just different projects, right? And so you can see here the Redstone Studio. So if I click on the Redstone Studio and I click Manage Studio, this is how I would go in and manage this Redstone Studio that we built. And you see there's been 197 hours in this studio right now. If we jump over to the team, you can see the the team of people that are involved in the studio. So it was really these three that were using the, the cloud workstations to, to deal with the edit. Uh, if I jump over here to workstations, now let me back up. So when you're in teams here, you can invite members real easy. So if you want to build a team, if they have a registered user, you could just find that user. Like if I wanted to add Scott Johnson, I could find his user and then click invite and he would basically get a notification and says, hey, we want you to be part of the team of Redstone. Do you accept? We would accept, and then he could show up later on in the process so I could add him to, to a workstation or to a project or to storage. Um, or if they don't have a user, you could just put in their email, and then they would accept through the invite of the email, and they would quickly get a registered user and then part of the team. So it's really go out and build a team. Um, so I'm not going to invite anybody, obviously, but and then workstations, if you want to build a workstation. So here's a workstation that we had built, a single profile workstation. So if I click on it, you can actually see the applications that live on this workstation. All right? This is a, It's based on Windows 10, and these are all the applications that are installed on that workstation. So all the Adobe stuff is really, we care about Adobe Premiere and After Effects for, for what we needed to, to do for the editorial. But any time, you could even like say, I don't need Mozilla on there. You could just get rid of it, update the workstation, say, yes, I don't want Mozilla on that workstation for whatever reason. And then it would just update that profile. So what you're doing is you're building and saving profiles. And then at any time, you could launch that machine based on whatever profile you needed. So the other piece of this is storage, you know, going here to storage. So we just had one shared volume called stone media and like i said that's right now it's um 
it's at 700 gigs of space. So I could scale this if I needed more. I actually have up to, I think, 1.4 or 1.3 terabytes of usable space in the studio. So that's the other thing is you, you, it's a bit about pay as you go, right? If you, you only need two terabytes to start this project, why are you paying for 10, right? And that's something that with Simple, it's very scalable. And you can get very granular on the type of workstations you need versus how much storage you need. And so you can start small, grow big, get through it, and then scale back down. So that, that was pretty slick. Um, projects here, we have one project, it's RS Editorial. I could go in here and create another project, right? And it would live under the studio, the Redstone Studio. So maybe if I wanted to create a project that was for all visual effects, I might type in um, RS VFX. There's a pipeline tool. I'm not going to go into that today because that's a whole other topic. But so if I'm creating a project and then I add this, I want the stone media to be part of this project, and I'll just mount that at the M drive. So this project, when you log in to work on it, it'll have access to this volume of storage right there. And then you would add your users here that you want to that you want on this project. So I'm automatically showing up because I'm logged in as this user. But if I wanted to add, um, let's go next here. If I wanted, let's remove this guy over here with this cricket with him. So if I wanted to add that user to the project, it will now show up. So if I go back here, one more. Sorry, got lost. So I basically added a new project in the studio. And when I log out, I'm going to log back in. You're going to see that there will be a second project to the studio. And I'm showing you all this through the web dashboard. But there's another, another way to work. And that's using the application that you actually install. So if I log out of this user, and I'm going to launch the Simple Cloud app. So there's an actual application that you can download and install on your thin client, which is we support Mac, Windows, and, and the Linux client. And so you can run through its own application. So I'm going to log in as this other user real quick to show you guys how, how much cleaner this is because I'm not, this user is not like a super user on a bunch of other studios. So if you're running your own studio, you would only see that studio that you belong to or that you created. And right now, I'm not seeing any workstations for this user. So I'm going to use this to finish off the demo. But if I go into the studio and then manage it, We'll go into workstations here. You'll see that we already have this workstation, but I'm going to build another workstation real quick. We'll just call this uh, RS. We'll call this a VFX station. So it'll be based on uh, maybe we want After Effects on there. And there's also versioning, right? If you're in a pipeline where you're not using a current version, you could use a drop down to choose a version that you want. So let's say I want to use After Effects 2019 version on that. And maybe I need to put Chrome on here. And maybe I need an artist that's going to use like uh, Cinema 4D. So I'm going to find Cinema 4D, and maybe they're on R21. We'll drag and drop that. So just by doing this, I'm I'm building a profile called VFX that's got After Effects, Chrome, Max on. Uh, hey, Jason, just yeah. a quick, just a quick question here, just to explain to everybody. So you're building the workstation with the applications, but just right. explain the licensing so people, uh, the folks can understand how the licensing works. Yeah, so like with Adobe, it's all sign-on, right? You're using your, your sign-on when you launch the application, you would sign on and then it would, if you have access to that Adobe application, that product or Creative Cloud, then it'll pull the license at that time. And most of the apps out there now are like that, but um, I, I'm not sure if the Foundry's changed yet. But if you don't, if you're already running a licensed server somewhere, we can use, uh, we can add your VPN. So through VPN, we can get onto your network with these machines, and we can actually pull a license from your on-prem server. So it's a bring your own license model. You're not paying for this stuff if you don't mm -hmm. own it. And so the good thing about the way things are today, you can get licenses for a month at a time. So when I talked about scalability, right, you can say, oh, I need a, I need a my license for one month for just this project, and then you could do that. So right. And what about if um, you want to ins you want an application that doesn't exist um, on the dashboard here? That's a good question. So we we like forty eight hours of notice, like the guys at Simple like to.
have noticed, but um, I've seen it happen a lot faster than that, like within four hours. If, if the application will run in a Windows VM, then you can pretty much have it, right? You just let them know, hey, I need this app for my pipeline, and then they'll get it put on. So. And Jason, okay. there's, there's a question about plugins as well. Yeah. Um, so let's, that's a good question. So let's say if I click on the Maxon icon here, the application, you'll see the plugins that are available for it. Well, if we needed to put Octane on there, we would drag and drop the Octane plugin on top of that stack. So same thing with After Effects. And well, After Effects, there's like a million plugins. So a lot of times for that, we're, we're like, just just tell me, you know, and then we'll we'll get those added to your studio. Same if there's like custom environment variables and things like that that you're running because you've got a, a specific pipeline, then those can all be added to your studio so that you're not doing that every time. It'll always be part of the studio when the studio comes up. And that's that's a bit of the custom stuff that goes in. But when you're working with, with these guys, they, they know that because they come from media and entertainment. So they're used to this kind of stuff, right? And they're helping get your studio set up the way that you need it set up to run versus being out there on your own just working like – I'm not going to say any names, but with other cloud providers where you're kind of building the whole thing. So these guys will have a team and a full pipeline team that are on staff to help you get everything set up properly. But this part is really simple. I mean, this is easy. You could quickly go in, build workstations, and just be up and running. Literally, you can build a studio in less than an hour with storage and everything. So here's where you you pick your resources, which is the level of machine. If you, you see right here, like an X200 is a very... Lightweight machine. One more, right? one more quick yeah. question before you move away from the plugins. Eric okay. was asking, uh, do you have to supply the serial numbers for the plugins, or it depends on how the plugin is licensed. Mm -hmm. So, you know that that comes down to each one is different the way they're licensed. I know with the Octane plugin, just because I went through this recently, it's a sign-on for that. So mm -hmm. once once you spin up your machine, you launch. Um, Octane, it's going to ask you to sign in. And so once you sign in, then it's been activated. So, yeah, a lot of the plugins are a lot like how the applications are licensed these days. So, And then some, some like uh, if you're running After Effects and scripts that don't even need a license, you just get those added into the proper uh, the scripts directories. Sorry, I can't see the questions coming in because I'm sharing. So oh, just stop. You, yeah. Yeah, Eric, if uh, that's okay. I'll yeah. keep an eye. Okay. Cool. I'll, I'll bring it up to you. Eric, Eric said thank you. All right. <laughs> You're welcome, Eric. Um, <laughs> so this is a, a different level of machines that you would choose. Obviously, I wouldn't run an X200 for this type of machine. I would probably build at minimum an X800, which gives me 12 cores, 48 gigs of RAM, and then 4 gigs of, of VRAM. So, but we can scale pretty high. I mean, we can actually go higher than a 16 if we want to because um, in each machine, it's bare metal in the in the data center. Each machine has two V100s in it, which, uh, which are, um, I think, are they 32 gig cards now, Scott? Yeah, yeah, they are. So, yeah, actually, so technically we can go up to 64 gigs on a single card, which is, is ridiculous uh, for VRAM. But, here you would just choose your resource of the machine. You could you could tell that machine whether or not you want it to have internet access. Like you could lock people down this way so that they couldn't like move data through like uh, Dropbox or something if you if you chose to. Uh, this allows studio licenses. I talked about like if you had an on-prem license server, you could turn that on, which would allow this thing to go through a VPN tunnel and and pull a license from license server. And we have to set that up, um, but it's it's a really easy process. So just depending on what VPN you're using at your facility. This little box here is allow simultaneous sessions. So let's say if I had only two effects guys, 3D guys that I wanted to spin this machine profile up at a time, I could set this to two. So that means a third or fourth guy couldn't spin up this profile of the machine. So that's what that is. If I leave it unchecked, and it's basically so if I had a hundred guys that need to use this machine, they could spin up this profile. But you could lock it down to say, hey. Once those machines are spun up, you can't spin up that profile anymore after two users. And then there's also this auto logout. So you can set a logout here in terms of, of minutes. Like you go to lunch, if you get the logout, some of the oops, some of the other players there, if you forget to log the cloud machine, well, you're racking up time, right? And so 
this thing is from a from the independent machine or from the individual machine i should say if you, you leave and it's inactive for 60 minutes it'll and we also have a global log out setting too that's set at default at 120 minutes so if you go to bed at night and you forget to log out it'll, it'll log itself off you're just not incurring those the billing cycles because you forgot to log out so um Damn. Jason, huh? we're coming to the we're coming to the top of the hour. I just want to point yeah, out. Yeah, sorry. Let me hit create real quick. Okay. So I basically just built a workstation called RSVFX, and if I want to assign a user to that workstation, um, sorry, you go over here to projects, and let's not put it in the RSVFX. I'm gonna put it in. Oops, sorry guys. Yeah, time went fast. What happened? Yeah, it goes back well, that's what happens when we're having good conversations. <laughs> yeah. like two that's right. So I just added this member here, and there's a workstation I you just built. While you're doing that, if, if huh? people, well, while while you're doing that, if if you're in a project and say that you built, you have a workstation going, and you're like, hmm, I don't have enough power. Um, how can how can you do that on the fly? Yeah, you can just flip the workstation on the fly, like this RS. Like when you're managing a studio of that workstation. Oops, go back here. I'll show you real quick. It's really easy. You just go here to your workstation and you say, okay, this RSV effects. I need this machine to be a higher powered workstation, and I could go in here and flip it right here and just hit update, and then that machine right. would be much more powerful. Or if you need to scale it back down, we realize like, hey. We're only doing Photoshop or whatever, and like, let's go down to a 400. We don't need to pay for that. So and that it's really affect easy. your media at all. Yeah, it doesn't affect your media at all because the media yeah. is all living in the shared storage. So, mm -hmm. cool. So that's done. I added that machine, and at this point, when you log in as the user, you see that machine showed up now because my users logged in. Jason Stone. I would just click the plug, and it would spin up the machine, and then. Once the machine's up, this takes about 30, 45 seconds. And I'd be, you'll see here, we'll be working in the cloud. So with that, it's uh, a minute till one. If we wanna, I'll just let you see this. So what it's gonna do is gonna launch the VMware Horizon client. Like Scott said earlier, that's the whole, the whole thing is built on that stack. So I'm just gonna putting in my password. I could put this in a keychain and then now what you're going to see here do you guys see that simple cloud app mm -hmm. volume? Yep. so now i'm looking at the remote workstation that lives in a data center so from this point out like if i alt tab here go back to chrome this is my local workstation right i could do whatever i need to check my emails or do whatever see you guys um, but then i could also bounce back to my cloud station still booting here but that's it i mean that's simple cloud in a nutshell yeah I wish we had more time. Yeah, it's it is an incredibly easy system, and you know, once you get it configured, it it gives you very very flexible uh, work environment where you can add storage, scale down storage, um, get better performance out of your workstation. If you, if you don't need the performance, you can scale it down, and it's all a matter of you know tailoring it to your workflow and also to save save money right it's a it's a budgetary thing so it's yeah. a really great and flexible system well, well said I, I think if, if people have any questions you know, please type them in you know we can, we can answer them on the fly here yeah and we're happy to circle back and do some one-on-ones with anyone that missed anything yeah. you want to have you know ask more questions or whatever so we don't want to we want to be respectful of everyone's time as well but it's almost finished loading here i think it's taking a little bit longer because i'm sharing on this but there we go i'm on my windows workstation at this point and you can see all the applications uh the new stuff the simple launch is going to launch there's chrome but it's just a windows machine at this point that I'm yep. gonna work on this. amazing so awesome. that's it <laughs> cool. thanks jason yeah thanks for taking me through jason Oh, uh, you're welcome sorry i had to rush through it oh, no worries so like you said um we're happy to do a, a longer demo for anybody and go into more detail if anyone likes yeah. to see that. Um, but great, I, I think we're at the top of the hour. So um, um, thanks guys for joining. Thanks all for the conversation. And, and uh, I put my email in the chat. You know, if people want more information, just please email me. 
Um, and and uh, yeah, it's great. Thanks a lot for your time today. For everybody that Thank joined. Thank everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Have a great day. All right. Bye. Cheers. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye. <laughs>